have prayer for us, and then we'll let her show Gekka, and then you can go forward. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for fellowship and for the privilege we have of coming together, even through technology here, and for the fact that you are with us. Thank you for your spirit. We pray as we discuss the topic of interpretation that we might get insights that, that you lead us to help each one participating today. We, I'm in a position to lead the discussion, but Lord, there's so much wisdom in the group that's gathered here. We cherish, pray that each one would share as they are led, and uh, we give you the praise and the honor. Bless our time together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well. Is she going to show? Oh, she, let's see what Brianna is going to show us. Is she still coming? Yeah, she is. She is. <laughs> it kind of leads us into our discussion. When Brianna comes, we'll we'll stop. I guess she'll show up. But there she is. And some of you might some of you oh, might need to click on gallery view so that you can see everybody at once. Oh, There's a little button that says gallery view, and if you hi click, guys, yeah, hi. Brianna, thank. You. There, go See. ahead and talk, Brianna. What is it? This is Gekka. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah. Oh my goodness! Is this a new member of the family? No, she's just my pet, and I love her. Oh, <laughs> wonderful! <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. He is so cute. <laughs> he looks very lovable. Yeah, it is. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, we'll start with our lesson. I don't like it. Why is interpretation needed? I must have to admit that when I first started studying this lesson, it made me think about <clears throat> our role or my role in the male portions of our group here today, we have to do that a lot, interpretation. Because some of us live with women, right? And, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> and you know, sometimes they say yes, and they really don't mean yes, or no, and they don't really mean no. And, and so I'm just have to admit that portion uh, as I started studying this, how important it is to... Richard, yes. we, we never do that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, so just as an overview uh, of what we're going to be studying today is why is in interpretation needed? And we're going to be looking at presuppositions presuppositions or um, what we come into preconceived thoughts and ideas uh, about what we are reading because we're focusing on the scripture. And secondly, we're going to be talking about the fact that what we're reading has been translated. So it has been translated either from the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic. So there's that aspect involved in translation. So we're getting it, you know, probably second or third handed and then the culture that it was written in the bible culture at that time so in some cases it was close to six thousand years ago and four thousand years ago and two thousand years ago when jesus was here and so forth and then we're going to be looking at we in our fallen sinful nature how we you know we're a little as far as our nerve endings, they're not as sharp as Adam's were. So how we're going to interpret what we read. And then why is interpretation important? Which is a topic called her, her, hermeneutics. Her, how do you say? Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Okay. So apparently this gentleman, or no, this God back in that time of, 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 of Herman something, but he was a, a what was it? A messenger? <laughs> You're with this with me, just to help explain. <laughs> no, that's just the name of it. 
Yeah, yeah but there, there's a there's a structure basis for that. But anyway, so we'll we'll, we'll it's up as far as it'll go. Huh? Okay. Now, so, well, you want? Let's start with the memory verse. Who would like to read the memory verse for us? Anyone ready? Yeah. Yes. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. Okay. Anyone want to put that, or do you want to put that into today's language? Isn't that today's language? Well. Let's talk about it. But without well, faith, it is impossible to please him. Go ahead. Well, if you don't have faith, God is not pleased. And if, if we want to come to him, we must have faith that he is. If we don't believe in him, how are we going to come to him? And that he is the rewarder. If we diligently seek him, he will. we will find him. Okay. I've appreciated our little um, Wednesday prayer meetings that we have together. And as Tony has let out in that, you know, we, we have been, at least I have been blessed in the fact that I have been making that effort to, to get up early in the mornings and spend that time with the Lord. And not just doing Sabbath school stuff, but just spending time and 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 just a little picture if you can see yourself sitting as jesus is an instructor and you're as a, you're a, a student and if one can get into that habit of diligently seeking him i i find that that time will become more and more valuable um Anyone want to share any experiences they have with this idea of diligently seeking him? What what habits do you have in your life today that demonstrate that, that maybe some of us could share and, and just appreciate and maybe follow? Well, since I hurt my foot and I spent three and a half months sitting on my chair, uh, I started really studying. I was It was a a blessing more or less to have broken to hurt my foot i don't want to go through it again hope i learned the lesson whatever it was uh but i started studying and i tried started first in matthew and i read a chapter a day and then i went through john and now i'm in romans and it's some amazing i'm just reading it for the first a chapter a day for the first 16 days here and I'm surprised at how much I really know about mm -hmm. what it is. And then on the other hand, I'm surprised at how much I don't know. Mm -hmm. So in the next end of the month, I'm going to get the book by George Knight. I already have it. I'm going to go through what he has to say about Romans because he has, a, he has a lot of knowledge about it. But it's a very interesting book. I've never really Sutter. wanted to study it before. Yeah. But, so that's one of the things I've learned that's right. when, yeah, no, when I'm sitting mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, to study a little bit more and get to know God and to get to know the Holy Spirit and invite him into my life. One of the, in, in the Sabbath lesson, it talked about something that maybe you have done. I know I have done before. Uh, we have come in the morning to say, Lord, speak to me. And we would open up the Bible and just randomly see where that led. And, uh, you know, in the story there, it talks about a woman who discovered that her husband was involved with another person, and um, she opened up the scripture, and it just pointed out how there's somewhat danger, because she went back to Genesis, where I will put in between thee and the woman, and type of thing. You probably read that in the, the Sabbath uh, portion of the thing. So, I'm sure, have, have, have any of you I'm sure have done that, correct? Where you just say, Lord, I need your voice. Show me. And we open the word. We know that this is the living word of God. Any comment on that? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I, I think that that, uh, that can lead to some problems. 
<laughs> but but I think too sometimes that you know if you're desperate and seeking God, sometimes that might work. He might direct your finger yes. to the right text. Yes. yes, he works through all ways. That's right, all different ways. That's right. Very good. Well, yeah, I guess okay. we can be guilty of of that where we you know try to use some scripture to to fit our narrative and it always ends up biting us but um with uh with careful study and prayerful study you know you can with the holy spirit's leading you can find the truth right if, okay. if you're diligent right i i think richard like like um dana and eric were saying we we do need to be careful we could go to all kinds of strange places if we picked out a few words that we happen to light our eye on in, in the scripture. But at the same time, we've all experienced where we will be heavily burdened and, and praying and we'll start to read. And amazingly, what we started to read that day was exactly what our heart right. needed right, right there. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, presuppositions. Um, what, what do we need to say about that? The lack of, of belief. Let's turn into our Bible to Luke 24, verse 36 to 45. And the question is, what hindered the disciples from seeing the true meaning of the passage in the Hebrew Scripture referring to the Messiah? Who has that? Matthew 24, verse 36 to 45. I have it. Okay. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet. That is... I myself handle me and see for spirit does not have flesh and bones as you as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have ye any food here? So they gave him a piece of boiled uh, broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I had a, an experience this last night, and the one beside me was sleeping and I had a dream and I heard this ah oh, type of noise you know and I, and I petted her and what was the problem and she awoken and she said someone just it was like came from the dead do you remember that she was just doing that thing and, and here it talked about how she how the disciples were terrified they had just seen Jesus hanging on a cross, and then he was buried, and now he's appearing toward them, and, and, and so that same kind of response, I guess, happened to them. So, But if they had read the scriptures and understood the scriptures, they would have understood. They would have believed. You know, uh, Richard, uh, we're so indoctrinated not to believe in spirits and stuff that might come to us and they were probably also indoctrinated that way. So when it did happen, it really messed with their minds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the scripture had been there the whole time, but they had preconceived ideas. And um, that overruled everything. I think that's, well, you know, we're, we're living in these days now, these last days, that there's, we're told that there's going to be counterfeits of this and that and so forth. Um, one counterfeit, just what are some of the co common 
today presuppositions that people read in the Bible? Uh, share share with me. What what are some common ones? Well, some people because they believe that Sunday is the Sabbath. Okay, that's a, one of the things that Paul has said in the New Testament. Okay, that's a perfect good example. Immortality of the soul. Yeah. Okay, living forever. Well, people use Peter's vision of the sheep to say that we can eat whatever we want now. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. They don't read the rest of the story. That's right. The um, delusion about ele evolution and the seven-day creation week, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's another one. What promises in the Bible gives us hope that we can go beyond any faulty presuppositions and receive the clear word of God? Let's look at two verses. Someone look up John 16, verse 13, and someone look up Psalms 32, verse 8. Want me to read 13? Sure, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but what or whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And that's Jesus talking and telling us that the spirit will come and tell us all truth. Okay. That's encouraging. Yes, it is. And things to come. So we don't have to be in blindness. Yeah. That's a promise. God doesn't lie. Okay, and how has Psalms 32 verse 8? Psalms 32 verse 8. I've got it. Okay. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. What a promise. I just had word that my one of my daughters had just graduated from SLA, or granddaughter from uh, Force City, I mean Force Lake, is just, just baffled by the fact, what do I do now? Doesn't have a clear vision and how we want to encourage and instruct and to, to day by day, you know, we're told that Jesus, when he was just on earth, he got direction day by day from his father. He did not plan, but he went day by day and God opened up to him. And here's a promise that is there. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. What's that mean? What's that last part mean to you? I will guide you with my eye. I was thinking about that. Sometimes parents can guide their children with the eye. You mm -hmm. give them a look and okay. they know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> not, 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 that's not the kind maybe God has. Maybe he has a better deal. But, you know, kids yeah. know when they're doing wrong and they look at their mother and mm -hmm. she gives them that evil eye or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can communicate across the room with our but husbands and wives sometimes. Uh, That's right. That's right. The other one knows. <laughs> well, and if you look at the next verse, it says, do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding. And I think guiding with his eye is meaning he's helping give us understanding. Okay. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was thinking, too. It's clear vision. Yes, you know, you. where you can see, uh, like for you as a parent, you can see your kids not supposed to run across the road. They don't have that vision where they are thinking ability to think ahead that look both ways. Mm -hmm. So you have the vision, the clear vision. Hey, there's a car coming. I think I think of a, a blind man. You know, my 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 eyesight is this moment. And if I think of my God, he sees the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. I will guide you with my eye. 
my God has eyes beyond my moment, and he will guide us with his eye. What a blessing mm-hmm. to think that he will see us through, uh, through the journey, through our pilgrimage. Amen. Let's move on to translation and interpretation. So we talked about what the original language is. Anybody familiar much with Hebrew and Greek and the other language? <laughs> basically, basically, I know there's a language like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all Greek to me. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> One of my thoughts about going through school was, should I go into the theology program or not? And I started taking Greek, and I thought, no, I need to move on to something maybe a little different. But it just wasn't one of those things that I had a passion for. Okay, so how can we be sure we have a reliable translation of the text? Anybody have thoughts on that? I had I had listened to um, Derek Morris, and he was sharing something that I thought was interesting. Do any of you remember HMS Richards? Yes. Yes. He used to have the radio station and started the Voice of Prophecy. And I remember him as a child. He would come to camp meetings and so forth. And it was said that he read the Bible through 180 times. And he did it in 12 different translations of the Bible. And so that was kind of interesting to know that he didn't stick with any one certain translation. But in order to get an interpretation, he, he went through different translations. That was hmm. interesting to know. An example for us, by the way, 180 times. I don't know how old he was when he passed away. But anyway, let's see. So. So um, the multiple translations is is good. Uh huh. They'll give you insight to different words in the text or verses. They can, you know, by having multiple, you can see the direction. Mm-hmm. So it refers us to a, a Psalms one thirty one verses one and two. So let's take a look here. Psalms 131. Who has it? Share it if you have it. Yeah. I do. Go ahead. This is in the New Living Translation. It says, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. At the top of that chapter, Psalms 31, my Bible reads, simple trust in the Lord. Like a child. Like a child. On my screen, Wade came, comes up. Wade, do you have anything to share with us? I'm, I'm just coming in a little bit late. Um, I did catch some of the points that were being made. Um, the Going back just a little bit, if I could, um, to the point about the eye, yes. about, guide, about God's guidance with his, uh, with, with his eye. I see him like it was said that he has he has a vision for where he wants us to be. He has a bird's eye view for things as they are, not as how they seem. And with our trust in him, if we put our trust in him, we are able to live a life. We are able to live the ultimate life that he intends for us to live. Um, I like the 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 passage that says, um, "Higher than the highest thought can reach are God's ideals for His people." Mm-hmm. Amen. And um, that only comes from from His vision. He knows where all the minds are. He knows where all the trouble is. He knows where where we don't see it and where we don't detect it. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's by our dependence on him, almost we almost have to be blind to self, but but to depend on his vision so that we could um so that we could experience a life, the ultimate life that he wants us to, to have. Very good. Amen. There was a part of our lesson that really talked about the blind and uh it, it, I'm not sure right now exactly where that was, but it was when Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. And but those that could see seemed to be blind. And it had to do with the fact that those who could see had confidence in themselves, where those who were blind realized their dependence upon the Lord. Anyway. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hey, Richard. Yes. Um, you know, last night I was listening to Hope Sabbath School, too, and they talked about this Psalms 131. And uh, the different translation says a nursing child and yeah. one that's been weaned or one that's just got done nursing. So what are they saying there? Because one is a weaned child is like it's not nursing anymore. And um, you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to. Like a growth process. You're, you know, you're nursing, then you get weaned. Um, as a, even a little child learns. You should be like a child, but be humble enough to learn. That's yeah. You know, I, I kind of gathered, too, is um, contentment. Yeah. After, you know, <clears throat> even though you're weaned or you're still just done or whatever, that baby is content. Right. I I have, yes. There, this morning on our walk, um, there's a, there are two nests we've been watching. One is a red-shouldered hawk, and it has two babies that are all fuzzy in their heads, but their feathers are coming. And, and one is an osprey's nest, same situation. And those babies are not contented at this point. <laughs> Crying, calling, looking, where's mom? Where's dad? Where's the food? You know, and just calling all the time. And this, this verse, David is saying, I'm at peace. I'm content. Right. That's, I, uh, I got a phone call, this, or not a phone call, but a message this morning from my granddaughter, Janie. And she just texted me to let her know that, let me know that she was praying for me today because she knew I had this responsibility. And Janie, I responded and just let her know that by her calling me and sharing that with me, it just gave me a peace and a calm. Because when I, my granddaughter prays, the Lord's going to honor that prayer. And it just brought that kind of peace and contentment to me. I'm kind of an introverted person and enjoy So it's not natural to, to do what we're doing today. I'm more of a sit back and enjoy the journey that somebody else leads. So anyway, I appreciated that. There's one more thought that I want to bring forward, though, too. And that is that. It's interesting that the analogy of feeding um, is being used here. Um, And we're talking about the word. And I think God is saying, just like somebody suggested, that there's a growth process from when we first are introduced or when we don't know God until a point when God... God is building an army. He's building uh, a legacy. He's building an image of what he looks like in us. Right. And so he's taking us past adolescence, spiritual adolescence, into a place where we can, where we can choose to harmonize with him and allow him to use us in such a way that the world sees what he looks like. Right. In, in, in its maturity not just from my vantage point, because fr- from the very beginning, we have, we have a tendency to be very primal and to see things from a self-centric vantage right. point. And, and God takes us 
past that point where, like he did with Job, where he, when Job went through everything that Job went through, and he didn't have answers, and he went, he looked to God and he said, God, why is all this happening to me? And God did something very interesting with Job. He didn't address Job's question directly. He asked Job where he was when the stars were made. He asked him where he was in the whole scheme of everything. He gave Job a different perspective, Mm -hmm. a, a mature perspective. And so I guess ultimately what I'm trying to say is that God wants us to be in a position where we are fed and not just fed for ourselves, but so that we are in a position to feed. Excellent. Which leads us to our next point. Uh, I wonder, Roy, would you mind reading for us from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 32? Because this talks to about, did you get that? Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 32. What is the cultural context here? And I think we can relate this a little bit to our call to minister to others and share with others. What is the chapter you mentioned? Acts 17, verses 16 to 32. Verse 32? No, verse 16 to 32. Start with verse 16. Okay. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred with him in him when he saw the city holy given to idolatry. Okay, honey, you want to continue? Verse 17? Here. Here. Let's continue. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took, took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us or in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think Mm -hmm. that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. 
And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So, right, you've read that, if you started your lesson. What can we learn from that as it relates to us sharing with others? Comment, if you'd like. Anybody? We met them at where they were. What did he say to them? You guys are very religious. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see people in your neighborhood that are very religious? They may not go to your church, but they go to another church. But isn't that an interesting entering wedge? I see you're very religious. What else? He noticed that they had a God. They, these people had lots of different gods, but there was one God that to stood unknown. out to the unknown God. They had something there, you know, and, and even though it was a sculpture or something that they worshipped, he mm -hmm. found a common ground with them to the unknown God. And so then he started communicating about the unknown God, who that unknown God was. So he got their interest. He shared with them about the unknown God, that this unknown God doesn't need a stone. He doesn't need an earth. And he's the one who made all of this and so forth. And I just thought as we, as I read that, how, you know, God is, you know, quite honestly, we have a tendency, or some of us do, to stay with our own little, so to speak, maybe our church group or whatever, and, you know, a little hesitant to reach out. And maybe it's a good idea for us to learn a little bit about things that we have in common, common thread with those neighbors around us so that we can you know, not chase them away with things that are new to them, but find common ground and grow from there. Any comment? Richard? Yes. It, you might not see on your screen, um, but first let me just say two quick things. Okay. Um, those of you that have come on, if you click on, if you have the opportunity to click on Matrix View or, let's see, what's it? It's not Speaker View, it's Gallery View. That would let you see everybody at once. Mm -hmm. Also, if you click on participants, there's supposed to be a little button down at the left that lets you raise your hand if we're not noticing you. Right now, I'm able to see everybody on my screen, but, but Richard, I noticed it looked to me like Vance might be having a thought that he wanted to oh, share. Please. Thank you for interrupting, because I, don't even, I didn't even see Vance. <laughs> right. Unless he talks, it's probably not showing up on yours. So This is my uh, first time on, so I, I haven't used this before. Yeah. Well, welcome. Okay. So share your thoughts with us. Uh, I probably look like Rodan the thinker, but I was just <laughs> taking it in. But um, uh, one thought that stood out to me is that Paul's um, Paul's motivation was not to be right. Paul's motivation was not to score intellectual points. Paul's motivation was not to put down people and their foolish assertions or their foolish uh, beliefs. Paul's motivation was to connect people to the life source. Mm -hmm. And as such, he became all things to all men to win some. And I think that uh, I pray that that is the type of motivation that we take into our uh, outreach to people, Amen. that we have a, a, a clear message as Adventists that is so, to us, is so logical, makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to contrast that and put ourselves maybe a little higher or feel a little superior and I think we need to get rid of that notion and approach people as Paul did from the, from the motivation of connecting people to that life source and to that, that happiness by whatever means necessary. Okay. So I, I've, I feel that I, that's one thing to me that stood out about that passage. Okay. That thought made me think of uh, Doug Batchelor when he started um, his little review of this lesson. Talked about here we have one Bible one Holy Spirit, and we have 4,000 religions. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> one Bible, one Spirit, you know, and how interpretation is what we're studying is really, really important. Interpretation of the Bible. 
because so everyone of these 4,000 religions probably feel like they, they're on the right track. So, <clears throat> may I mention something, uh, Richard? Yes, Roy. I was um, reading the chapter four of uh, Deuteronomy and the verse two. Deuteronomy. Um, <laughs> now that you are mentioning what in interpretation uh, should be or means, uh, I want to say first that I believe that we have the Bible as was revealed by God. And uh, we shouldn't be afraid to read the Bible as he reads because um, it's the word of God. So when we go to the Bible, we need to approach it with confidence, knowing that what is what it is written was inspired by God and is a message directly to us. So on that sense, no further interpretation might be uh, applied to the passage that mm -hmm. we are reading. But we need to approach it with confidence, knowing that God is trying to tell us something. Mm -hmm. um, and a good example is on, on Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. God, uh, through Moses, was saying to, to Israel, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command in you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. Amen. That principle for me is really, really telling in the sense that um, it's not my place to come and interpret what God is saying, but rather is to accept with humility what he is um, commanding me to do. And I, I believe if we, if we approach the Bible on that way, we are not, we are in a safe place. We are walking in the, in the rock, which is the word of God. Right. I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. Um, you take, uh, I've heard that William Miller used the Bible and the Bible commentary. And, and you know, you can do that kind of thing. And the Holy Spirit, that's why we ask the Holy Spirit to be the interpreter. Amen. Keep I, the Bible I, and the confidence. I want to say one more thing. There is no substitute for knowing the author. No. There is so much room. We, we posed the question last week when we were going over, why is it, I posed the question in, in, in my segment, um, why is it that so many can go to, the, to Scripture or to the words, and come away with fallacies. And there were various reasons for that. But I think one of the most daunting, one of the most important factors that, that actually affects or impacts our ability to, to understand God's word is to understand God himself and to have a connection with him. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a connection with him and we're just reading the word as if it's a textbook, or as if it's, we, I'm limited to my perspective, to my way of seeing things, to my experiences. And so I can look at things scripturally and misinterpret sometimes what is being said because I'm applying my vision to God's word. And so our safe, our safe place, the one consistent way to, to come up with unity across the board, is for all of us to find God first and then to, tr to try to understand the word from his perspective, not from ours. How do you sub subscribe to finding God first? Richard, yes. just, just a minute. Shelly raised her hand. Oh, good. Um, Go ahead. That, that's where some people are trying. It, it appears on some people's screens and it's not appearing on others. We need to do right. some experimenting yep. but thank you right yeah um i think it goes back to where we we're talking about using the different interpretations uh sometimes I'll find <clears> a, a different passage and read it at, like two or three different ter interpretations or even a paraphrase that's where like wade was saying we have to know god and let him lead us into putting all that together into what the you know, holy spirit's trying to tell us really is the truth mm -hmm. amen 
And, and Richard, we feel like we're just getting going. This is being a blessing to all of us, but it's about time for us to finish up and so that, so that we can get things turned on over to the church program, too. Let's see. Um, let, let me just close off, then, a few thoughts. I find that how we get to know God is through prayer and talking to him. And when we talk to him, just I think of this morning when we, we talk to our Father in heaven, and we think of our Father who said, um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. But our Father loves us, and he gave us his Son, and then he gave us his Spirit. And he promises to be with us, and there is that love relationship. You know, as I, I was studying the lesson, I printed out a song that we probably all know. And as we read the Bible, may it lead us to this, the fact that Jesus saves. We have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves. And the other thought was from Jude, verses 26, that he is able to lead us and to see us through our journey, our pilgrimage. And... Uh, and may we each uh, learn to correctly interpret, uh, to know him, and know of his love, and, uh, and be blessed. So let's close with prayer. You want to pray? Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessing of being able to have your word. Help us to know you, the source of our word, and to know that you're not far from any of us and that we can grow and we can live that life of that little one that had just been weaned and is comforted, we can live that way in your presence. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And we just thank you for that. Lord, lead us through this journey, through these days that we're living in. Keep us each healthy. We thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Richard, and we'll keep experimenting. Um, I, I see Alice and Isaac have gotten on again. <laughs> well, we're just finishing and going to now switch over to the live stream so that we can watch the sermon. Uh, next week, Dana is going to have lead out in the Sabbath school, and we'll go ahead and try it again by Zoom next week, and hopefully we'll figure things out, uh, make it work a little better. I s well, well, come everybody come prepared because I'm not used to standing here by myself. <laughs> so come prepared to talk. All right. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting, and now we'll go on to the live stream for the sermon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sebastian decided to give his life to Jesus in an unusual place, the soccer field. The Life Hope Center helped me have the Word of God in my heart. A few months before, he was excited when his parents Moises and Angelica signed him up for soccer lessons at the Global Mission Life Hope Center, just down the street from their house. Sebastian worked hard at the lessons, and his skills improved quickly. But soon he realized he was learning more than just soccer. Sebastian had met Jesus through the one year in mission volunteers serving this urban center of influence in Santiago, Chile. He felt like he needed to share his new love for Jesus with his parents. So each day after soccer lessons, while walking home with his parents, Sebastian told them about Jesus. It was around this time that Sebastian's grandmother got very sick. Sebastian was worried. During this difficult time, Pastor Abraham Cabezas who led the center's outreach programs, began regularly visiting the family with his team of one-year-in-mission volunteers to pray with them and encourage them. Sebastian's parents enjoyed these visits, and in time, they requested Bible studies. Eventually, the love of Jesus won their hearts, and they were baptized. Soon, his grandmother regained her strength. The family is eternally grateful for the friendship and care shown by the one-year-in-mission team. To this day, 
the volunteers selflessly give up their time to be lights of hope in the community. We find these volunteers who are willing to give their gifts, talents and abilities to serve others. We have so many types of workshops, like cooking workshops, language workshops and exercise workshops that are used as an instrument, an opportunity to follow Christ's method. That is why through these workshops many people can mingle with Adventists and through their service they can know the Lord. Sebastian is so happy when he listens to his parents talk about their new lives. And here's why. So that we go to heaven. Thanks to your faithful support of Urban Centers of Influence, Sebastian's goal of having his family united in Christ has become an exciting reality. I want to express my gratitude to Global Mission for believing and trusting in these projects. At any moment, the King in Heaven will return and we will see the result of all of the effort from Chile and the whole world.